Happy Sabbath. Let's kneel for a few moments, spend a few moments in prayer as we prepare to receive a word from the Lord this Sabbath. Father in heaven, it's time for thee, Lord, to work. For they are already making void thy law. The crisis is upon us, but we have no fear. We place fear beneath faith, faith above fear. And today we magnify your name, we glorify your name, because our God is a man of war. Vengeance belong to him. And today, as we bow in your presence, we pray for an awakening, a spiritual arousal. May we understand not just the times in which we're living, the times in which we're living in, but the work of preparation. I pray for every home to be prepared, every heart to be ready. Soon and very soon, the work will be over. Anyone here not in a good mood, we pray for the Holy Spirit to abide with such persons. As we direct our thoughts to you in the most holy place, of the heavenly sanctuary, we pray you'll feed us with hot bread. Give us Bible repentance. Grant us revival. Reformation is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I want to turn your attention to Mark chapter 1. Where are we going to? Mark chapter 1. And I want us to focus on Mark chapter 1 and verse 14 through verse 15. The four principles of end time Bible studies are found in Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and verse 15 where Jesus says the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and do what, my friends? Believe the gospel. And that is the formula of Christ's messages. And this is also going to be the formula that we are going to use as we go throughout this study today. I want to introduce this message by pointing your direction to a statement in testimonies, not testimonies for the church, but testimonies to ministers. Page 409, page 410, and page 411. Notice the first paragraph. It's also found in last day events. It says, the great issue so near at hand, what is that issue? The enforcement of Sunday laws will weed out those. Will do what, friends? So what will the Sunday law crisis do? It's going to weed out some people. Who? Weed out those whom God has not appointed. Hmm. And he will have a pure true, sanctified ministry, prepared to receive what, my friends? The latter rain, the sealing, to give the loud cry message to an apostate church and a dying world. The second paragraph, many will stand in our pulpits with a torch of false prophecy, 
in their hands, kindled from weird, the hellish torch of Satan. Is that one sentence being fulfilled right now, friends? You better believe it. Listen what it says. Some will go out from among us who will bear the ark no longer. And what was placed in the ark? The ark of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So will they be sifted out? It says, but these cannot make walls to obstruct the truth. Why? For the truth will go, how friends, onward and upward until what? Until the end. This past week, brothers and sisters, during midday power surge, I covered the fact that Adventist Review and Eric Lau published this article entitled Vaccination, Mandates, and Freedom. How to approach it logically. Logic, contradictions, and paradoxes. And in this piece, this article, Adventist Review and Eric Lowe, who claimed to be a pastor, he stated that Jesus said it is okay to break one of the Ten Commandments in order to preserve life. Red words. He's, he writes, Jesus is clear that even one of the Ten Commandments could be broken to preserve the life of an animal. And he quotes Leviticus, Luke rather, Luke chapter 14 and verse number 5. It goes on, watch. So, it follows logically that an ingredient derived from an unclean source that may be a necessary ingredient in something that can preserve and save lives is what? Is acceptable. Did Christ teach that we can violate, break one of the Ten Commandments? If that were the case, that means Jesus sinned. Because sin begins in the thoughts. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is what he's teaching. Christ sinned. And notice, brothers and sisters, this is the edited version from Adventist Review. They quickly edited the article. But look what they forgot to do. It would have been better for them to remove the whole paragraph than simply change the words. They write, thus, the thought that an inoculation might contain unclean ingredients is often considered an obstacle. Here is the edited sentence. Jesus is clear that none of the Ten Commandments is broken in preserving the life of an animal on Sabbath. Does that sentence fit the previous sentence? Nor should an ingredient that can preserve and save lives be rejected because it is derived from animals not fit for food. Does that middle sentence fit there, brothers and sisters? And the point I want us to see is that this article was published September 11, 2021. When was that? Last Sabbath. I covered this article during midday power search on September 14th. That's September 11th, the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th. And they never thought of changing the words, editing the article, until it was presented on September 14th. And now people, Safe to Serve International, began to comment under the article on the Adventist Review platform. And they were sending scathing rebukes. And what did the editors of the platform do? They began to delete comments. And the more they deleted, 
the comments, what you, you think happened. The more God's people commented, sending in Bible truth until they had to just delete the whole comment section. That should show us the power of protest. The power of presenting present truth in the context of a great remonstration against abominations, against apostasies. To let them know we will not tolerate apostasy. By the way, take a look at this, brothers and sisters. This same pastor, Eric Lau, claims this is his resume on LinkedIn. What schools did he attend? Andrews University, the most recent. He went to Southern Adventist University. I wonder where did he learn that theory from? That Jesus taught people to violate his Ten Commandments in order to preserve life. Did he learn that from Andrews University? Southern Adventist University? The bottom says he attended Amazing Facts College of Evangelism. Is that where he learned that from? Look at this. He's presently an associate pastor in the Texas Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Red Arrow, he's also a Dallas or was a Dallas area youth and young adult director. So what is he teaching young people? That Christ sinned and Christ taught people you can transgress the law to preserve life. In other words, he's teaching that the end justifies the means, which is blasphemy, to say the least. And that's why I quoted testimonies to ministers, page 409, that many will stand in our pulpits with a torch of false prophecy in their hands. Kindled, that means it's blazing. Kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. Do we not see it, brothers and sisters? How much more abominable can you get to teach that Jesus taught people to sin? It says, watch carefully, friend. He also put there presently, he's a vice president of marketing for GYC. Is that what he's teaching at GYC conferences? You can sin and still be saved? Who taught that theory? Who thought, taught that theory? You can transgress God's word, disobey God's commandments, and still be saved. Is that not Satan? Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 4. <laughs> You can disobey God, and you shall not finish it. Surely die. That's spiritualism, brothers and sisters. And what is the end result of spiritualism? Not only death, but spiritualism lays the foundation for Sunday sacredness. Great controversy. Page 588 says, through the two great errors, the two great what? Errors. The immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Satan will bring the world on his deception. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter create a bond of sympathy with Rome. These are the men that will tell us to preserve the earth, to preserve the planet, to preserve life, to combat climate change. Nothing is wrong with going to church on Sunday. Preserve life. Jesus taught you can violate one of the Ten Commandments and still be saved. Look at this, brothers and sisters. So what does God want in these last days? Is God simply looking for males? In the church? No. Education. Page 57 says, The greatest want 
of the world. The greatest want of the church is the want of full males. Mm -mm. Because many are males, but not spiritual men. But men, men who will not be bought or what? Sold. Men who in their innermost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to do what, my friends? Do you see that? To cause sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for what, brothers and sisters? The right, the what? The heavens fall. This right here, brothers and sisters, is a crime scene among Seventh-day Adventists. You cannot get more grotesque, more abominable, than to put in print and publish that on a seventh day Adventist platform that Jesus taught you can break one of his commandments. That is a seventh day Adventist crime scene. What happens when you go to a crime scene or you find yourself in a crime scene? You take up your cell phone and what do you do? What do you dial? Three numbers. Why do you dial 911? It's a what? It's an emergency. And the operator comes on, and what does he or she say first? What's your? You never called 911. You, you, you never called 911 before. Praise God then. 911. Next. What's your emergency? And brothers and sisters, this is an emergency. Volume 3. Testimonies for the church, page 280, we're told, if God abhors one sin above another, for which his people are guilty, is doing nothing in a case of an emergency. Indifference, neutrality, in a religious crisis is regarded by God as a grievous crime and equal to the worst type of hostility against God. It's right here, brothers and sisters. Volume 3, page 280. Last phrase, red words on the line. It's called a grievous crime. Black words on the line. It's a case of an emergency. Seventh day Adventist crime scene. Not only a crime scene, it's a grimy scene. Look what the first sentence says. This blindness and apostasy had not closed about them suddenly. It came upon them how? Gradually. My words. As they spurned, resisted the words of warning, instruction to righteousness. Second sentence. And now, in this fearful crisis, in the presence of the idolatrous pastors, who were priests, pastors, the idolatrous pastors, and the apostate king. I wonder who the apostate king would be today. You mean the local conference leader? You mean the chief editor of Adventist Review for publishing that piece? You mean the general conference president, the union president, an apostate king? The people remain how? Neutral. If God abhors, what does abhor mean? If God despises, if God hates one sin above another, is doing nothing in a case of an emergency, brothers and sisters. Are we living in a time of crisis? Look at this, brothers and sisters. Who also taught that Jesus sinned? The Pope of Rome. And that's not surprising. What does the Bible call the Pope of Rome? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 4, 
the son of perdition. But give me the second title for him. The man of what? The man of sin. So what must he teach? Nothing but sin. And that Christ sinned, that's what he said, that Jesus begged forgiveness of, from Mary and Joseph. Christ sinned. Would you expect that theory and a similar sentiment coming from a Seventh-day Adventist pulpit, a Seventh-day Adventist publication? It's a Seventh-day Adventist grime scene. Crime scene. So where is uh, the, 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 the call for an emergency? The call for alarm to be wrong. Silent brothers and sisters. Do you know why? They want to protect their retirement checks. And their invites to the next GYC conference, the next church conference preserving their name and statue while they are blaspheming God and supporting that blasphemy. Past that, he go, I won't spend much time here because basically these two paragraphs, he's teaching the end justifies the means and basically saying receiving the pestilence 19 inoculation does not defile a person in a religious sense. Is that so? Is that so? Brothers and sisters, does eating the wrong food defile you in a religious sense? What does the Bible teach? What does the Bible teach? How much more putting poison in your body? Babylon's magic bullet. I'm going to come back to this. What happened to the Review and Herald? The building, the name, the ministry from which Adventist Review derived its name, it was burnt down. I wonder why. What were they printing? What were they printing? Red words. What were they printing? They were printing soul-destroying theories of Romanism and other mysteries of iniquity. And as a result, what happened to the Review and Herald publishing house? It was burnt to the ground. So what is God saying may happen to Adventist Review? And these men, if they do not repent. And notice, instead of them publicly removing the blasphemous article and reposting a recantation, they try to edit the words. What does that spell? It spells deception. Blasphemy. They have become the great gates of hell. Past that, let's go. My friend, what is today's date? It's September 17th. September 17th. Don't correct me. What is today's date? September what? September 17th. Why am I doing that? So you won't forget that date. Today is September 18th. What was yesterday's date? September 17th. What happened on September 17th, 18, 1787? 1787 in America, it is known as what? Constitution Day. What day, friends? Constitution Day as well as Citizenship Day. And notice right here, my friends, this date... It's also celebrated for one whole week. That's President Biden's proclamation. Constitution Day, Citizenship Day, Constitution Week. When? From September 17th through September 23rd. What's the difference between September 17th and July 4th? 4th of July, what is known? to have taken place 4th of July, 1776. The independence of America. That date is actually the date when they say America was born, 4th of July. But September 17th, it represents 
the date when America grew to an adult. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Let's see how important this is. Watch carefully. Red words at the bottom, July 4th. The date America was born, September 17th, marks the country's passage into what? Adulthood. What scripture sounds similar to this? The birth of America and growing into a dragon power. What scripture comes to mind? Let's go through then. Revelation chapter 13. And look with me at verse number 11. When you're there, my friends, just say amen. It says, Revelation 13, and verse number 11 says, And I beheld another beast. What are the next two words? Coming up out of the earth, having two horns like a lamb. But what, my friends? He spake as a dragon. Who is this beast? The United States of America in Bible prophecy. What does a beast represent in prophecy? A beast, a regular beast in prophecy. A kingdom. Give me a scripture, Bible student. Come on, put it down. Come on, come on. We all will have to declare this truth. Daniel 7, verse 17, verse 24. All right, Daniel 7, verse 17, verse 24. And a beast points to a kingdom. And a kingdom represents a nation. Kingdom, nation. 1 Kings chapter 18. And verse number 10. My friends, this word, coming, it means to grow. Great controversy, page 440. Coming up out of the earth. The coming of phrase, red words, literally signifies America growing or springing up as a plant. America, brothers and sisters. And what is seen on the head of this beast? Two what? Two horns. And what do horns represent in prophecy? Horns, kings. Do kings have power? So put it down. Horns represent powers. Put it down, brothers and sisters. Powers. Put it down. Revelation 17. Verse number 12. Revelation 17. Verse number 12. Daniel chapter 8. Verse number 7. Daniel chapter 8. Verse number 7. Habakkuk chapter 3. Verse number 4. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse number 4, horns represent powers. And the Bible says, two horns like a lamb. So who would the lamb represent? Christ. So what two grand principles did Christ teach all throughout scripture? Write them down. My friends, a separation between God and Caesar, two horns. A separation between God and Caesar, Mark chapter 12, verse 13 through verse 17. Mark chapter 12, verse 13 through verse 17. Now quote this with me. I'll start you off. Render unto Caesar. The things which are Caesar's, and render unto God the things which are God's. The two horns, a separation of church and state. That's it. Look at the screen. Great controversy. Page 441. Mm -hmm. The two horns, lamb-like power, brothers and sisters. It points to what? It points to republicanism. And Protestantism, note that. What two things? Republicanism, which means a nation not ruled by a king, dictator. Protestantism, a church without a pope. That's it, brothers and sisters. At 
its head. Protestantism, protest. Put that down, brothers and sisters. All right, two horns. It represents the principles found in the Declaration of Independence. The two horns, the principles found in the Constitution. Red words underline the Constitution. I want to read something here. Blue words just before the last phrase. It says, freedom of religious faith was also granted every man being permitted to worship God according to what, my friends, the dictates of his conscience. But what does the Bible say? In verse number 11, America will speak as a what? Dragon. Not only will America speak as a dragon, but she will act like a dragon. Looks like a lamb. Speaks as a dragon. Looks like a lamb. But acts like a dragon. Go to verse number 12. Revelation 13. Will America force us to worship falsely? That's verse 12. Not only will she speak, but she acts. Skip on down to verse 15. Verse 15, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause. That as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. Yes. Looks like a lamb, but acts like a dragon. Have we begun to see draconian policies stripping away our civil freedom, religious freedom? So what is happening in America? Mm -hmm. Looks like a lamb. Not only speaking, my sister and brother, but acting like a dragon. We are told, we'll clearly see it. When we begin to see policies that are being uh, enacted to come against liberty of conscience. And right now, God's commandment keeping people, God's people who believe in Bible health reform, God's people who reject Caesar's magic bullet are no longer being tolerated on the job you're no longer being tolerated in the community no tolerance for us yes in the church they have no tolerance for us even among some families they can no longer tolerate are a biblical stance on Bible health reform. It shows America looking like a lamb, but acting like a dragon. Not only America, but the professed Christians. Looking like a lamb, professing to be Christian, but in their speech and action, they are living like a dragon. Great controversy, page 442. I won't read all of this. It says, are we together, friends? Amen. Look at the last sentence. First sentence first. The lamb-like horns and dragon voice of the symbol point to a what? A striking contradiction. All right, friends. Let's pause right there. What about our spiritual lives? Is there any contradiction within us? Professing to be Christians, yet we live like devils. In the marriage, among siblings, professing to be Christians, yet we live like devils. It says, watch carefully. It says uh, plainly, 
What is coming? The symbol, red words on a line, plainly foretells a what, friends? Development of the spirit of what? What two things? Intolerance. And what else? And what else? And persecution. So when we see this, it means the morphing is taking place. The transition is taking place. Looking lamb-like, but acting like a dragon. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Has pestilence 19 with its policies be began to show us the morphing? Looking like a lamb? Acting like a dragon? Look at the headline right there, friends, in the red box. It says, uh, declining what? Tolerance. By those who are inoculated with the pestilence 19. For the people who are not inoculated with the pestilence 19 panacea is about where I am right now. A spirit of intolerance. Is it here now, friends? Look at this. It says, watch carefully. Great controversy. Page 442. This is what the Constitution of America says. What date was yesterday? September 17th. And what day is that known for in America? Constitution Day. How long do they celebrate that for? One week. Are we in the week still? So what must I focus on this Sabbath? The Constitution. You watch the different perspectives of that term and word Constitution as I go further. Stay right here. The U.S. Constitution, it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of what? Ah, of what, friends? Religion. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. I want everybody. Open your eyes wide, brothers and sisters. Look at those red words. It says, and that, read this with me, red words. And that what? No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States of America. Do I have volume, volume of the preacher? Hold on. What does that say? The U.S. Constitution guarantees. I'm simply going to reiterate that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification for any office or public trust. In other words, if, if somebody is running for a Congress seat, you cannot and should not consider his religion as a support or that which would disqualify him or her from that seat in Congress, Supreme Court. Does it make sense? Oh, friend, but now application. We want to apply for a job. And the boss man says, have you received your pestilence 19 inoculation? You say no, because of my religion. They say now, present that exemption letter. Brothers and sisters, what is that? That is a religious test. <laughs> From different perspectives, that is a religious test. As a qualification for this employment, what does that say, America? America, looking like a lamb. Speaking, acting as a dragon. And what is so terrible is that we are seventh day 
Adventist run institutions who are making our religion a qualification for employment. Seventh day Adventists looking like a lamb, but speaking and acting like a dragon. We can also read this and put the word health. Red words again. And that no what now? And that no health test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust. Hold on, brothers and sisters. What did the president just enact last Thursday? All federal employee, all right friends, in order to retain employment, must pass a health test. No, come to the screen preacher, are, are we there? No health test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office of public trust, America, looking like a lamb, acting like a dragon. Headline, religious exemptions to inoculation mandates could what? Could what? Could test what, friends, sincerely held beliefs. You mean test? From health test to religious test, looking like a lamb, acting like a devil. Give me some order, preacher. Listen to this. Employment attorneys expect... Are we ready? Pay attention. No joke here. Employment attorneys expect exemptions on, on a religious basis to be few and far between. And again, that's because of the high stakes nature of the virus. Um, they are going to ask probing questions and they're going to want to make sure in, their, in the interactive process that an employee is not seeking an exemption, an exemption under the guise of, of their religious beliefs when really they object on a personal or social level to the vaccine. They'll be asking you what? Probing questions. In other words, it has not become a health test as a qualification for public employment. La looking like a lamb, <laughs> brothers and sisters, Speaking like a dragon, acting like a dragon. Look at this, brothers and sisters. I covered this during midday power surge. You have uh, companies, employers now saying, if you dare submit a religious exemption letter, we are going to find out if what you believe is consistent. In that letter, if you dare write about your health principles, then we want to find out if you take other medications. And if you take other medications, then that means you should take the Pestilence 19 Panacea. That's it right there, brothers and sisters. It says, uh, if you put certain things in the exemption letter about fetal cells, they say, look, do you take Pepto-Bismol? Do you take Tylenol, Aspirin, Tums, <laughs> Clarity, and Mortrin? Do you take Sudafed? Achoo! Do you take Benadryl? You get the point, brothers and sisters. They will deny. What, what asinine words are these? Similar doesn't mean same. Unconscionable for this to be in print. They are making this a what? A health test as a qualification for your employment. I wonder if one day, if we are forced to work on the Sabbath, and we present a religious 
Sabbath exemption letter to our employer. I wonder if our employer should do a background check into our lifestyle practices and find out and finds out that you who profess to be a Sabbath keeper requiring a Sabbath exemption from employment. You're not a consistent Sabbath keeper because once church is over, we have found out you go to a restaurant on Sabbath. Church is over. What happened? Come on, Johnny. Come on, Mary. We are going today. Golden Corral. Oh, you saw my face. I was searching for a place. How would they find out, Pastor? How would they find out? Have you ever heard of credit cards and debit cards? Have you ever heard of the coming ominous cashless society? How would they find out? How would they find your grocery list that you're buying Pepto-Bismol and aspirin? How would they know? Mm, 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 mm. Listen to what this says. Employees are asked to attest, watch this, that they truly acknowledge and affirm that, quote, my sincerely held religious belief is what? Is what, friends? Consistent and true, brothers and sisters. The U.S. Supreme Court says you don't have to prove to anyone that your religious belief is consistent and true. Lamb-like to dragon-like. Look at this, brothers and sisters. I put the actual reference right there. It says, uh, but it is not for the courts, nor your employers, to evaluate the truth or logic of an objector's religious beliefs about what would make them complicit in an immoral act. Red words. Religious beliefs need not be acceptable. Logical. What's the next word underlined? Consistent. Ah. Uh, or comprehensible to others. In order to merit your job, to merit your employment, to merit protection to merit and exemption. Looks like a lamb. Acting like a dragon. But of course, this doesn't matter. They are going by a satanic influence. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Let's pass that. Then they say they're going to terminate you. The Constitution is on flames. It says no religious test shall ever be granted as a qualification for an office. No health test. Why? Your religion is connected to your health. At least mine's is. My religion and my health are inseparable. And what God has joined together, let not Caesar nor Babylon put asunder. No religious test. No health test. The Constitution is on fire. Ready for either? There is a picture representing a bullock standing between 
a plow and an altar. With the inscription, read those three words, ready for either, ready for either the plow or the altar. The plow, uh, I can retain my employment. The plow, your job. The plow to work, no, or the altar, sacrifice. You're terminated. Dropped from school. Ready for either the plow or the altar. Are you ready, brothers and sisters? It's time to be ready. This pastor was signed a religious exemption letter for inoculations, but what is the requirement? If you donate to his church, Washington Post, September 16, 2021. Is that of God? Is that of God? Anyone who does that, they're looking like a lamb, but speaking and acting like a dragon. Volume 5, page 451. What day was yesterday in America? Constitution Day. All right. And what will they celebrate all week this week? What are we told would happen? Volume 5, page 451. It says, watch carefully, how much of this? Red words, it says, under the influence of this threefold union, our country... America, what will America do? Red words. America shall what, friends? Repudiate. What does that mean? Abolish, cancel, repudiate every principle. What does every mean? All, every principle of its constitution as a Republican and a Protestant government and shall make Provision for papal falsehoods and delusions. And the last phrase says, uh, then we will have to guess, conjecture, speculate, no. Then we may know the time has come for what? The marvelous working of Satan and that what? The end is, end is, the end is. Near. How close are we, brothers and sisters? Revelation 13, go back there with me. What is that animal that represents that beast that typifies America? A beast. Two horns like a lamb. And speak as a what? A dragon. Do you know, my friends, in the year 2016, what did I say? How many of you, I wouldn't expect this from prospective Seventh-day Adventist, you're not yet baptized, but those of you who have been baptized, you have gone through a prophetic Bible study series, Daniel, especially Revelation. Have you ever seen the imagery, the illustration, the drawing of the beast that represents America? Tell me if he looks like this. Does the image look like this? Does the image of America look like this? All right. Headline, headline, 2016, the bison to become the first national mammal. What's the national bird for America? The bald eagle, right? So what is uh, the national mammal? What is it, my friend? The, why the bison? Fifteen facts. First fact, the bison are the largest mammal. The what, friends? 
And remember, what words are used to illustrate America? Coming up, grooming. Yes, little preacher back there. Yes. As a large, powerful nation. When was that done officially? And by whom? Look at the screen here, friends. President Obama signs bill declaring the bison, the what, my friends? The National Mammal, the first time in history. And Bible prophecy teachers among Seventh-day Adventists have been preaching this for years. I mean decades, even before October 22nd, 1844. Using that imagery for America. But when did that image become officially that which represents America 2016? And you are still wondering, are we living in the last days? That's the reference at the bottom right there. You could go right there, doi.gov. Past that, brothers, is that what you always saw? The bison. But of course, it's the same as the buffalo. But for America, we call it bison. The French, buffaloes. <laughs> That's a nugget for you. Move on. It says, and who, my friends, despises the U.S. Constitution? Popery. Great controversy. Page 564. And what is more devilish than this? America was the land that protected the woman from the dragons' persecution. The pilgrims fled to America. What were they fleeing from? Church and state union in the old world. Persecution from Pope and they fled to America. America preserved, protected the woman from the dragon. But the Bible says now, the same America will prosecute, persecute the same woman like a dragon. Revelation 12. Look at verse 16. Are we there? And the earth helped the woman. Who is the earth? How do you know it's America? What scripture confirms it's America? Revelation 13 and verse 11. The beast coming up out of the... Thank you. The earth. What does a woman represent in prophecy? The church. The, hell, the earth, America, helped the church. And the earth opened her what? Mouth. How does America speak? Through her laws. So what laws did America establish to protect the woman from the papacy in the old world? What laws? Give me two of them. The upon which you hang everything else. What two? Religious, okay, republicanism, Protestantism, or civil freedom, Religious freedom, the earth helped the woman. But look at this now. Verse 17, and the dragon was wroth, underscore that, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Pause right there. The dragon was what? And went to make what? Went where? Went where? Huh, huh, what? When, why do you say the dragon went to the earth? Because in verse 16, that was where the woman went. The church. To be protected. So where she went? 
to be protected. The dragon went there. The dragon has come. And what date did the dragon power enter the place where America speaks? <laughs> How does America speak? Through what branches of government does America speak? Legislative, that's Congress. Judicial, Supreme Court. White House executes it. Does it make sense? And when did a dragon power, dragon, Satan, dragon, serpent, the papacy, Vatican, the divining serpent. When did he come to the place where America speaks? What year? 2015. And what happened in 2016? What did Obama do in 2016? Does it make sense, brothers and sisters? 2015, September, and by May 2016, the symbol that represents the prophecy of America, lamb-like, no more, dragon-like. How close are we, brothers and sisters? The dragon went there. Now you see now in the year, in the 1800s. What did the popes write? In the 1800s, brothers and sisters, talk to me. They wrote what? The U.S. Constitution guarantees what? Liberty of what? Conscience. Go tell your employer that. Go tell Mr. Floodgates that and see what they tell you. Surrender liberty of conscience. Roll up your sleeves and take this needle in your arm. No more liberty of conscience. Looks like a lamb. Acting like a dragon. Hold on, friends. By the way, red words, the absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential error, a pest of all others, most to be dreaded in a state. The Pope says, uh, we must anathematize. What does that mean, brothers and sisters? Anathema. Anathematize. Excommunicate. Expunge. Prosecute. Get rid of whatever you want to say, whatever other synonym you want to use. Anathematize those who assert the liberty of what? Conscience. And of religious worship. That's it. And also, all such as maintain the church may not employ what? Force. That's why they call Bible believing Christians, Sabbath Christians, Bible health reformers, pariahs, outcasts. We won't tolerate you on the job, in the community, in the church, in your families. Lamb-like, now dragon-like. All the articles telling us Mr. Biden's mandates are what? Unconstitutional. That's it, friends. Looks like a lamb. Acts like a dragon. There it is, brothers and sisters. Now, look with me at Revelation chapter 12. Beloved, when you see America looking like a lamb, but now speaking, acting as a dragon, it means one thing and one thing only, that Jacob's time of trouble is about to become a real thing, come to fruition, great persecution. This is what it means. And we are unprepared. Whenever God gives prophecy, he shows us the prophecy in the past. 
Will America speak as a dragon? Is she is speaking as a dragon? That's the last days. At the first advent of Jesus Christ, was there a dragon power? Who was that? Who was, who was the mouthpiece, the leader of the, that dragon power? Tell me his name. Tell me his name, everybody. Come on, louder. Louder. Herod. Did he speak? Was he wrath? Come to verse 3. Revelation 12, verse 3. It mentions a red dragon. Satan, primary sense. Herod, secondary sense. Go to verse 4. The second phrase of verse 4. After the word earth. It says, and the dragon stood before the woman, the church, which was ready to be what delivered? For to devour her child as soon as it was born. Let's prove Herod. Go to Matthew chapter 2 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Matthew chapter 2. Look with me at verse number 16. Everybody, look at verse 16. How did Herod feel? Matthew 2, verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that, she was mocked of the wise men. What are the next three words? What are the next three words, my brother? Louder, everybody. He was what? He was exceeding wrath. Was the dragon wrath at the first advent? Hmm. Will the dragon be wroth again in the last days, my friends? Now, what happened next in verse 16? Did the dragon speak? Yes. And what did Herod enact? Kill all the male children, two years and younger. Let us make sure we enact a policy to get rid of the deliverer. Get rid of the reformer. Get rid of the savior. Get rid of the protestant. Did Herod only get wrath? Did Herod only speak? Did Herod also act like a dragon? What happened in verse 17 and verse 18? Lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Among God's professed people. As it was at the first advent, so it will be. Just before the second advent of Christ. Looks like a lamb. Speaks like a dragon. To better understand that, study Herod. First advent of Christ. Do you believe it, friends? All right. Let's talk about preparation. Did God the Father protect Joseph from the dragon? Did God the Father protect Mary from the dragon? Did God the Father protect his son, Jesus, from the dragon? Will God protect us today? Hebrews chapter 13. Verse number 8, the Bible says, Jesus Christ, we can also say, God, the same. Yesterday, the same. Today, the same. Forever. And how did God protect Joseph, husband, father, Mary, mother, wife, Jesus, son, child, from the dragon's roar? God the Father, let me so much time. God the Father prepared a place of refuge. And this should encourage us to evade and to endure the last day's dragon roar. You need to find that place of refuge. 
And the beautiful thing was that Joseph, Mary, did not even know where the place of refuge was. But God the Father knew. So why worry? Why worry? Lord, where am I going to go? Why worry? Volume 7, page 298 says, Worry is blind. Worry is what, my friends? Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But God knows the end from the beginning. He says, and in every difficulty, he has a way prepared to bring relief. Matthew 2, go to verse number 13. It says, now where was the place of refuge? Verse 13, and when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, underscore that, Joseph in a dream, underscore that, saying, Arise, Joseph, and take the young child and his mother, and what now? And flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Question, what if Joseph and Mary did not flee and met the dragon face to face and said, you would not take our, you would not take Mary's son. You caught that? You would not take Mary's son. What would the dragon have done to Joseph and Mary? You see what's happening here? Come to verse 14. When he arose, did he listen? Or did he ling linger like a lot? Did he linger? Did he listen? Verse 14. And when he arose, he took the young child and the young child's mother by night and departed where? Into Egypt, a place of refuge. My friend, a second principle. Write down Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, verse 14. One more time. Revelation 12, verse 6, verse 14. God prepared. A place of refuge for the woman, the church, between 538 A.D. through 1798. Since God did that for the persecuted church, the Protestant reformers, the Wardenses, the Albigenses, the Huguenots, can God and will God do it for all of us today? Jesus the same yesterday, as C.D. Bruce would say. Today and forever. I believe it. Do you believe it, brothers and sisters? Amen. You need to cling to these promises. Isaiah chapter 33 Verse 15, verse 16, Isaiah says, those who are converted, your defense, why would I need a defense? War. Your defense shall be in the munitions of rocks. That's in the country, the mountains. Bread shall be given you, and your waters shall be, finish that. What's the last word? Sure. Ministry of Healing. Page 481. It says, Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us, for which we know nothing. That those who accept this one principle of making the service of God supreme, will find perplexities vanish and a clean path before their feet. 
The songwriter says, uh, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, but by the living word of God, I shall, finish that, prevail. Why? Finish it. We are standing on the promises of God. Why worry? Do you know God may have somebody out there already have acreage, acres, with your name already on it? Mm -hmm. If it's even a tent, at least you have a cover for your head. A small structure is already on it with your name on it. Just for you to be faithful and not to be despondent. And guess what? It might be free. Can you spell free? And don't say free means P, spell P-R-I-C-E. That's not free. Spell free. You're thinking how to spell free? Look at the screen, my friends. Country living. Page 30 says, watch carefully. Let men of sound judgment be appointed not to publish abroad their intentions, but to search for such properties where in rural districts in easy access to the cities. I wonder why. For aggressive, effective evangelism. I won't spend time there. Red words, look for such places just out from the large cities. Is Atlanta a large city? Where suitable buildings may be secured. Let's read now. Either, come on, that, read your promise. Come on. Either as a what? A gift. What's a gift? Who does not like gifts? Raise your hand. I thought so. Either as a gift from the owners or what? Purchase at a reasonable price by the what? By the gifts of our people. It can be given to you free, number one. Or if the owner decides to sell as a test, I have no money. It says you can purchase it by the gifts of our people. So don't, if you don't get it free, God already has other like-minded people, other converted Seventh-day Adventists who will call you one day and say, Andrew Henriquez, I have a monetary gift for you. Lord, I'm waiting on that call. I have a gift for you. And the months and years I've been praying, the prayer is now answered. In what name must I put this check in? By the way, they might give me a blank check. Carte blanche. Write whatever you want to write inside. You mean I can write 500, one, one million, anything. I won't abuse your kindness. The property is just 100,000. What? The gift from our people. God protected. God provided for Joseph. Mary, his son, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Does it cost to move from the city to the country? Unless your vehicle drives on air. And very, very soon you have to pay for the air too. If Mr. Floodgates and the Pope have their way, you're going to pay for air to breathe. Pay for that. It costs. So how did God the Father provide for Joseph, Mary, his son, Jesus, to flee from Jerusalem, to flee into Egypt? How? How? The wise men. I 
and the wise men were ignorant. Why do I say that? They had no concept or comprehension that Herod wanted to kill Jesus. When they gave to, to Christ the gold, the myrrh, the frankincense, Come on, Matthew 2 and verse number 11 is when they gave up. Joseph, Mary, and Christ the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Verse, 11, verse 12 now says, And being warned of God in a dream, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. That means when they gave Christ the gold, the myrrh, the frankincense, they were ignorant of the wiles, the evil intention of the dragon. It was afterwards God gave them the understanding the dragon is coming. Vehemently is he coming. The wise men were simply kind. I hope we are kind. Simply kind. And as they gave the gold, they didn't even know that they were giving Joseph and Mary the resources to move from the city to the country. Will God send or away some wise men? I need to give you my address to come knock on my door. Come on, wise man. But how can we receive the wise man? Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some, finish it, have entertained Angels unawares. Application. So to accommodate the wise men, you need to be hospitable. Kindness begets kindness. Love begets love. Sacrifice leads to a blessing. Am I hospitable? Lord have mercy upon me. Are you hospitable? Are you selfish? Can God provide resources for us? Desire of ages? Come on. It says, listen, they gave their hearts to Christ as their Savior, the wise men, then put out their gifts. What were in their gifts? Red words, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What a faith was theirs. He who never slumbers nor sleeps was watching over his beloved son. What scripture is that? He who never sleeps nor slumbers. It's one of my favorite psalms. Psalm 121. Verse 1, shall I lift up mine eyes unto the hills? From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. Who is he, my friends? Who is he, the maker of? And surely he will not suffer your word. He that keepeth thee, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Listen. He who had rained manna from heaven for Israel and had fed Elijah in the time of famine provided in a heathen land a refuge, a what, friends? A refuge from Mary and the child Jesus. Oh, mothers, single mothers, does Jesus care? Yes, he cares. Single mothers, single parent household. Does Jesus care? He cares so much for you and your child, your children, as he took care of the widow and her one son. In the time of Elijah, 
in 1 Kings chapter 17, that same God is alive today. That same God will care for you and your son, daughter, children. Mm -hmm. Single fathers. Fathers, you have been struggling with your child, your children. Does Jesus care? Listen, friends, red words, and through the gifts of the Magi from a heathen country, the Lord supplied, I love that word, supplied the means for the what? The journey into Egypt and the sojourn in a land of what? Strangers. Why worry, my friends? Steps to Christ, stop worrying and what? Steps to Christ. Page 94 says, uh, why is it the sons and daughters of God are so unwilling to pray? <laughs> when prayer is the key in the hand of faith to do what? Unlock heavens, storehouse. Where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence? Steps to Christ, 94, book it. Volume 8 and page 12. Come to God, come to God and plead the shed blood of Jesus. As reason, as reason why you should receive help. You should receive help in the warfare against evil. Come, brothers and sisters. Volume 8, page 12. Ah, oh, brothers and sisters. The wise men received the dream. Don't go back to the dragon. How did Joseph understood? The dragon is wrath. Flee to the, the country. How did Joseph know? From a dream. 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 Hold on. Hold on. A dream. There are many ways dreams come. One way, dream cometh through a multitude of business. Write this down. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 3. Dream cometh through a multitude of business. Whatever was and has been on your mind, is what you will dream about when you go to bed that night. Someone once asked me, Pastor, how can I say this? What causes the filth, the grimy dream? You know what I'm talking I got kids inside here. I won't be dirty up here. I said... <laughs> Because that has been on your mind. Dream cometh through a multitude of business. So because Joseph's mind was on God's business. God could give him a dream. The dragon is wrath. The crisis is coming. Now flee to this location. So what is God saying to modern day fathers, Joseph? What is God saying to mothers? Where is your mind? Yeah, it all began there. If your mind is on present truth, your mind is on Christ, don't fear. He'll give you the dream. He'll give you the vision. By the way, go to bed early. I'm talking to me. Me, myself, and I. Get to bed on time so God can speak to you in a dream. 
And brothers and sisters, did the angel of God lead Joseph to Egypt? You better believe it. <laughs> How many angels do you think were around Jesus as a baby in the arm of Mary? How many demons were trying to kill Jesus? Oh, my friends, but what says Psalm? Come on, Psalm 34. Psalm 34, thank you. And verse number 7, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that what? Fear him. And what? Deliver at them. How many angels surrounded Christ, Moses, Mary? My friends, will God do the same today? Volume 9, page 16. A powerful quote. Watch this. It is impossible to give any idea of the experience, the experience of the people of God who shall be alive upon the earth when celestial glory and a repetition of the persecutions of the past are blended. Let's read. They will walk in the light proceeding from the throne of God by means of whom? By means of angels. There will be what? Constant communication with us and heaven. Heaven and earth, brothers and sisters. Who says praise God, the angel of God, and campeth around them that fear God and deliver at them? Friends, will we, like Joseph, have an unbroken communication with Christ? So he can not only give us dreams, brothers and sisters, pouring out the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, dreams and visions, but he can lead us to the place of refuge. He can nourish us there and use us to assist others. Today I choose to have unbroken communion with Christ. How about you? How about you? I close with these words. Philippians chapter 3. Go there with me. Where are we going to, friends? Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. Do you recall what today and this week is called, friends? It's called what? It's called Constitution what? Constitution week. Look at this, friends. Dozens of Florida students signed petition for what purpose? To abolish the Constitution. September 16th, 2021. Looks like a lamb. But the spirit of the dragon is prevalent in the land. The dragon is about to rule. Like Joseph, am I getting the godly visions? Dreams come by what? A multitude of what? Beastness. And what says Luke chapter 2 and verse 49? What did Jesus say? Why are you looking for me, Mary and Joseph? Wist thou not? I must be, finish it, about my father's business. Luke chapter 2, 49, verse 49. The spirit of the dragon is here, brothers and sisters. I don't know what we're waiting on. Have you ever heard the term, brothers and sisters? Kill two birds with one stone, brothers and sisters. You know what? I'm going to give, give you all of it. Kill two birds with one stone. Have you ever seen that done? Back in Jamaica with my little big slingshot, my bingy, 
I've never killed two birds with one stone yet. What does that mean? You come back tomorrow for midday power surge? I'll tell you what it means. I can't, my time is up. I can't go there right now. I can't go there right now. What do you say? Go there? All right, brothers. Look at the screen right here. Kill two birds with one stone to achieve two things by doing one single action. And my focus is on the Constitution. Almost every object has different sides. My Bible has how many sides? Six sides and one inside. Seven sides. The Constitution, the document in America, but there is another Constitution. Pinch yourself. What is that? That's your body's Constitution. And the Pestilence 19 mandate is to destroy, finish it, the body's Constitution. Ah, you see it now. Do you see it, my friends? There's a war not only on the U.S. Constitution, but on what? The body's constitution. Mm -hmm. Saving the best for last. Don't sleep on me, brothers and sisters. We go higher and higher. We're climbing Jacob's ladder by God's grace. And there is another constitution. Brothers and sisters, what is the church's constitution? America's Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, etc., the laws, what is the church's constitution? The Bible, brothers and sisters, the Ten Commandments, the church's constitution. What does Satan want to do? Kill two birds with one stone. What two birds? Health reform, the body's constitution, the second bird, the church's constitution, the, the word of God, the law of God, God's seventh day is Sabbath. Two birds. One devilish stone. And don't call it David's stone either. Brothers and sisters, I wonder what that one stone is going to be. To destroy the body's constitution and the church constitution, climate change. To preserve health, to combat pestilences, cure for the land. We must enforce what? Sunday, worship by law and force. People to keep Sunday, the force destroys the U.S. Constitution. And Sunday destroys what? <laughs> Killing two stones or two birds with one stone. Hold on. So how do you view this now? Ah, I came back to it. Adventist Review, Pastor Eric Lowe. How do you reconcile this now? That's an article. One stone to kill two birds. Why? They are promoting. Come on, come on, come on. They are promoting the pestilence 19 inoculation. Destroying what? The bodies? Constitution. And then they say, Jesus sinned. You can break God's Ten Commandments to preserve life. So what else are they destroying? The church constitution, God's word, the Ten Commandments, the seventh day, Sabbath. Seventh-day Adventists using the same devilish stone to destroy two birds, health and the Sabbath. I can't stop there, friends. Cannot stop there. Philippians 3. Come back tomorrow. We talk about that. Killing two birds with one stone. And every time you remember Goliath and David. Remember that. Killing how many birds? Two birds. Two birds. With what? 
and then tomorrow I'm going to flip it because God gave us one stone. We have a one stone, and we must kill two birds. I wonder what those two birds represent. Tomorrow, by God's grace, Philippians chapter 3, let's close. What day is today, my friends? What week? It is what? My friend, look at the screen. The Sunday movement is now making its way in what? Darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue. And many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. Let's read now. It's what, my friends? Its professions are what? Mild and apparently Christian, but when it shall speak, but when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of what? The dragon. What scripture is that? Revelation 13 and verse number 11. How would the Sunday movement look? Come on. Blue words. Blue words. How would the Sunday movement look? As it makes its way in darkness, looks mild and apparently Christian. Two horns like a what? Lamb. But when it speaks, <laughs> it's a dragon's voice, brothers and sisters. You think I'm going to stop right here? Philippians 3. Yes, I hiss my teeth. Philippians chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friends? Look at this as we close. Go to verse 20. I'll close on a high. Verse 20, are we there? It says, for our what, my friends? For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Does anyone know what the word conversation means? Don't tell me a dialogue. Okay, here's your homework. Look, look up that word conversation in your concordance and the dictionary. The word conversation means sit. What, sister? Louder. Come on. Citizenship. Citizenship. And what is this week? Constitution Day, Constitution Week, Citizenship Day, Citizenship Week. Have we applied for citizenship forever? Or have you simply applied at the U.S. Immigration Office for your green card for America? Where is home, my friends? We should be our citizenship in heaven. I want to ask you a question. How many of you were naturalized? Raise your hand. Oh, please, 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 don't, don't, don't raise your hand. <clears throat> surveillance, surveillance. Where is Judas? Look out for Judas. It's scary, my brothers and sisters. Now, for those of you who did, did you have to take a test? Before you were naturalized and you were now declared a citizen of America? So what about the spiritual? Is there a test that we have to pass before we can become citizens of heaven? Literally, what is that test? What must we pass? What must we keep? Revelation 22 verse 14. Say it with me. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into that city. I choose today to be a citizen of heaven. Do you? Amen. Father in heaven, Who today desire Bible studies? 
and desire baptism or rebaptism, why not raise your hand right now for Jesus? Yes, my brother. Yes, yes, yes. Anyone else? Even those of you online, safe to serve international first time viewers. Father, we pray even now that you will seal these decisions. Who today say, Lord, I recommit my life to you. Why not raise your hand right now? A recommitment of your life. Recommittal. Yes, yes, yes. Even those of you in line. Father, seal these decisions. And today we choose to be citizens of heaven. The thief on the cross prayed, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. This is our prayer. And we accept your response as you gave to that thief on the cross. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Save us, we pray. And thank you for sweet salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, the church said, Amen. Amen.